Thank, thank you, Chris. And I want to extend my thank you also to the Seattle Public Library. They've been such a great supporter of the poet populist uh, effort in allowing uh, uh, us to use the facilities and promoting um, the uh, nomination and voting of the next poet, po the last poet populist, and the next one as well, by uh, distributing information at all the branch libraries. In fact, I'd like to tell, tell you a little bit about how the Poet Populist works for those of you who don't know. Um, unlike uh, Poet Laureates, which are generally appointed by uh, the executive of a government, which would be the mayor, the governor, or the president, the Poet Populist is elected by the people of the, uh, the kingdom, in this case, the municipality of Seattle. And, uh, or sort of a kingdom. And, uh, and in this process, and in this way, um, the, uh, the poet uh, expresses, um, I, I believe at least, and I think uh, most people participate, would express the, 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 the sentiment of the people in Seattle uh, representing an uh, amalgam of, of their thoughts and ideas. Um, the nomination process has begun, and there's a white sheet on that table there if you want to pick it up. Um, the, you can also go to my, my website on the city council website, and there's an, uh, a form you can download. The, um, the nominees are selected by uh, poetry groups or curators, so it's not just someone off the street. We'd, we'd like to make sure that the people who are being nominated are nominated by um, organizations that have standing in the literary community or individuals who've curated. Um, and the uh, voting, uh, well, the, the nominations go from now until uh, Monday, May 22nd. Uh, and then it closes, and the voting begins June 1st, and it concludes August 1st. Um, and then the top four vote-getters will read poetry on Monday, September 4th at Bumper Shoots Literary Stage. Um, and then the winner will be announced at that time, and a, a cash award will also be presented. Um, and Bumpershoot, again, has been a great partner in this effort uh, in uh, making a contribution towards the, the cash prize and also for promoting the poet populist. Um, last year, just for information, last year's uh, poet populist election resulted in over 1,500 votes being cast. And of course, the poet populist is uh, Pesha Joyce Gettler, and she received the top vote. And there were uh, runner-ups as well. And uh, it's a one-year period that one is a poet populist. Um, the, um, I think that's pretty much it I want to say about the poet populist and how it works. Um, I do want to say, too, that uh, and someone asked me, and I always like to promote poetry and never, whatever organization is sponsoring it. There's also the, the Grand Slam, for those of you who are interested in the Grand Slam. And that is uh, apparently they're going to be doing their f final Grand Slam uh, selection this coming Friday at Numos, which is 925 East Pike Street at 8 p.m. And um, I, as part of that, they have a, a, a function called Youth Speaks. So um, if you're free, uh, 8 o'clock Friday is the Grand Slam. They'll choose the top person and the Grand Slam team that goes to the Nationals, which I think is in June. So, And if there's any additional information around the Grand Slam, why don't you raise your hand, little? There you go. And she can help you get any additional information you may want on the Grand Slam. I want to uh, briefly describe the um, poets who are going to be uh, reading today. And also, there's uh, two musicians as well. And I'll begin with the musicians, because I, I think they're going to be performing towards the end, but I'll, I'll begin with them. Uh, there's Simone Le Drummer, uh, has been composing and performing on hand drums since 1987 first with several Seattle-based bands, and then for eight years as the founder and director of Ladies Don't Drum, a, uh, a unique all-women uh, percussion ensemble who performed with the Seattle Men's Chorus, uh, Maya Angelou, Holly Near, and Bobby McFarlane, among, uh, among others. And in 1991, Simone began teaching drumming for a loving and continues to do so today. Uh, bringing the magical rhythmical expression to uh, people of all ages, levels, and uh, genders. Um, would Simone, are you here? Would you please stand up so we can recognize you? There you are. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and the other musician 
uh, today is Esther Sugai, a composer and flutist, uh, performs with Anno uh, Jaiken Ensemble, an experimental music uh, ensemble. Her compositions have been performed at the Center on Contemporary Art, uh, New Music Across America Festival, Barge Music, uh, Mar Marzina, and Soundwork Northwest, and she has performed at the Vancouver Jazz Festival, Seattle uh, Festival of uh, Improvised Music, Bumper Shoot, uh, on the board, Seattle Art Museum, Seattle Asian uh, Art Museum, and Esther has received grants from uh, Meet the Composer and ASCAP, and is a, uh, and is a past Seattle Arts uh, Composer in Residence. Esther, are, are you here? Would you stand up, please? There you are. So I'm going to first describe the, the two uh, poets who will be reading before uh, Pesha reads, and then Pesha will be the last. Um, the first poet will be Judith Roach, um, and she's the author of two collections of poetry, uh, Mirror My Life as a Screamer and Ghosts, and is co-editor of First Fish, uh, First People, Salmon Tales of the uh, North Pacific Rim, which uh, won an American Book Award and has edited a number of poetry anthologies, a new poetry collection, uh, Wisdom of the Body is forthcoming from Black Heron Press. And I'll introduce her just a moment. The second uh, poet will be uh, J.T. Stewart, a uh, poet, writer, playwright, editor, whose work as a public artist includes poetry uh, broadsides in the African uh, Galleries, Seattle Art Museum, and Raven Brings Light to This House of Stories, a uh, collaborative permanent uh, art exhibit at, in the Paul Allen Library, University of Washington. Uh, she, she serves as a curator uh, for the 2006 Writers in Residence Program at Jack Straw Productions, Seattle's nonprofit audio center. And both of them will be uh, introduced by uh, Chris Hasegawa, who is the literary uh, director, would that be fine, of the public library. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm going to have to leave early because of the memorial today for the, the victims of the massacre that occurred on Capitol Hill. I'll be speaking and, and attending that, so I will not be able to introduce them, uh, as well as Pesha. And Pesha, um, Pesha Joyce Gettler is our poet populist, and is Seattle's poet, was Seattle's poet populist and is for the period 2005-2006. And it's a position that has enabled her to expand her expression for taking poems uh, where they are not ordinarily heard, such as City Hall, <laughs> and uh, also uh, homeless shelters to swearing-in ceremonies for the mayor and the, and the city council, and when the, we also uh, opened up our new City Hall. She gives poetry readings uh, and leads creative uh, writing workshops in North Seattle Community College, the University of Washington Women's Center, and many other venues in living rooms, gardens, uh, city parks, and uh, where she invites students to tie their poems to trees for passerbys to read and take if they choose. And I think it's a great uh, gesture and very symbolic of the dispersion of poetry uh, within our city and hopefully within our lives. And I'd like to just add a personal comment that um, we've had a, a number of poet populists and uh, they have all been very great and each in their own way have contributed much to Seattle. But I have been very impressed with Pesha in uh, her attitude that really captures the democratic spirit of what we're trying to do with the poet populace and her enthusiasm, her uh, ingenuity. She's a bookmarkers. I don't know if you brought any with you today, but uh, distributing those. Uh, but also, uh, we have requests that come through my office quite often for openings of various uh, events throughout the Seattle. And she has responded graciously by being willing to be at many openings throughout Seattle so that we've added an element of poetry to many civic events that would not necessarily would have had a poetry element. So with that said, I'd like to first introduce our first poet, poet uh, Judith Roach. Judith? This is such a great occasion. Um, do you know that Seattle is the only city in the country that has a poet populist? Other cities have poet laureates, but this is, this is a good thing. And I want to thank Nick so much for uh, making poetry 
in our city, much, much more, more just there, everywhere. So then we thank Nick. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to start with some poems um, that's a little suite of poems that are written either on the bus or on the city buses or um, thinking about the city buses. Uh, so it's called Public Transportation. One, to get to you. I crossed the street, tracked the free zone, transferred to another line so hard, I boomeranged on board, clattered my change and chattering my teeth, I shouted your name, my destination. <laughs> Overheard. What I thought I heard, I could have said. What I said I thought I heard instead, free falling through exploding systems of what got said. And real life question. What would you do if your daughter wanted multiple piercings on face and body parts? Would you say, sweetheart, let me help you? <laughs> Could go either way. On city streets, high heels, work boots, Doc Martens, sneakers, brown calf, alligator, mud encased creepers. <clears throat> and light slip. I rise at five, my window wall alive with light eating night, falling away in crumbles as day tears dreams like cloth too thin to wear outside without a slip to hide. <laughs> okay, um, this poem is called Drowning in Lake Michigan and it is literally my very first memory. I drowned. Um, my father pulled me out or I wouldn't be here, but I was um, two and a half and um, Lake Michigan, okay. My first memory looks up to sunlight through water. I'm on my back at the bottom and have already stopped struggling for air. The sun's full hands overflow, light leaking through the flawless blue. Quiet and calm like a silent song, mermaid I, I'm already at peace with my death before my father plucks and pumps me out, sputtering and crying as the water goes out in great gobs of thick air sear my lungs open again. I don't remember the coy ripple the lake lapped at my baby toes before the waves slapped me down and into her coarse-grained bed, cleanly wheaten and speckled shallow this close to where she cozies up to shore. But deep enough for a baby, my father forgot in a sociable moment, chatting up a new acquaintance. Always a talker, my father could make new friends anywhere while I was learning to love the depths. You'd think it would scare a child, but ever since I've leapt to water as my element, looked behind me to catch a glimpse of the ghost of my forlorn and missing fishtail forgotten in the rescue. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. The angels are not like the saints. They do not discriminate, but come to everyone. Their eyes burn green fire, but their kisses are icy. They can play rough when we get caught in the heavy crosswinds that swirl about their wings. They are not above artifice and sometimes appear in disguise, a mask of smeared lipstick, gypsy bangles, or an old man's coat. Now and again, they carelessly give us gifts, an unexpected hobby horse, a day's free babysitting, a poke in the eye with a stick, or a sudden slant of light on water, 
and we are grateful once we figure out how to move within their state of complex blessings. They work within great wheels and circles, turning light to dark and back again. They do not obey the laws of gravity, but laugh a lot and arise at will to hover like vast hummingbirds when we require attention. What they want of us is the mysterious secret we unravel and reweave down to dark and back again. Uh, this, this poem is called Open Heart, and it's um, a friend who had open heart surgery um, just this a few months ago, really. Um, but he stay, it, it's, it, it's an operation they know how to do really well, and they can fix people, and it did fix his heart a lot. But he stayed asleep for nine days, for a long time afterwards, he didn't come out of, the, uh, out of the coma. It was partially medically induced, but partially he just wasn't ready to come out. So um, you'll hear his voice in here talking. I'm, I'm saying this so you can follow it. Uh, his voice talking about where he went during those, that weird nine days. They slit you open, cracked your rib cage, and whispered to your open heart. Heal, they said, and that was fine, but you stayed deep asleep days after the surgery, nine days to be precise. But oh, the places you went with John while we kept vigil in your hospital room. Remember, this is a quote, remember John, it was Montreal or probably London. Then we went to Marrakesh. In Stilton, England, there was a cute young boy, very cute, but he thought I smelled too musty, and I probably did after all that time asleep. But we had lovely cheese there, pungent and sweet water. Someone grabbed another water sample, but it too was musty and didn't pass the test. I don't remember what test it was, but it mattered at the time. Then we went to Montmartre, and what a thing. It's all electronic now, like in Charlie's Chocolate Factory, cogs and wheels and machines purring and tubes going in and out and things whirring and spinning. And you know, John, I died before I awakened. We rode down, deep down in an elevator. Were there nightclubs and cafes and can-can girls? Oh, yes, but you must understand, I was traveling in a great deal of pain and from my hospital bed. But I couldn't find you, John. John, he was into the cognac. And why not when you're in Paris? What frightened me most was John was there, but he wouldn't talk to me. Then we went to the south, the south of France. No, no, the American South, Mississippi Delta, actually, and there were two big black dogs who disappeared in the swamp. John, do you remember them? In a redneck tavern, someone hit me really hard in the chest, and then there was a ceremony at Swedish Hospital for those who died. Do you remember, John? We sat in the auditorium, and it was only this Sunday. I wasn't sure which side of the aisle to be on. It was to commemorate those who had died. I understand they couldn't get out because their hands were tied and they needed water. A boat took us there, but my hands were tied too. The ritual was given by a society whose purpose was to learn the deep essence of the world reflected in water. There were people with no faces whose job it was to get to the heart of the matter. I learned the beauty of water, and it was exquisite. You know, John, I've already died. Thank you. I um, taught for quite a while uh, with incarcerated kids, and uh, at Green Hill, which is boys, it's the oldest boys in the juvenile system and the roughest. Um, and then also with girls a lot at Riemann Hall in, in Tacoma and at Echo Glen. Um, so this is, it. I'm going to read a poem from the boys and one from the girls. So this is called Throwaways. They are only boys, though murderers and rapists. 
Bad skin is an issue, candy bars a treat. Some are fathers, few have fathers. Ink pens are contraband, though new tattoos bloom daily on arms, inflamed by needles and pain. Beast and throwaway child, no one knows where they get the needles. Hate, love, live, die, my hands. They remember beatings and fishing trips. Will hurt themselves if no one will do it for them, or one another. Innocence assumes forgiveness. They are both the beast who lives at the heart of the labyrinth and feeds upon the flesh of others and the children thrown to the beast to twist and turn in serpentine path until they meet the hunger that will tear them apart. One boy stares with silent, wounded eyes, tied tongue, and writes a poem of ten women whose red dresses spread about their twenty severed hands in pooled blood. Even the other boys say he is sick. They haven't read his countryman, Lorca, who writes of sliced off breasts, the stain of 300 crushed crimson roses. Neither has this heavily medicated boy whose imagination flies an unencumbered bird beyond betrayal and forgiveness, beyond his drugged fog. He's found a vein, an underground river. He can ride to the lyrical heart of his own brutal poem. The difference is his violence does not stay on the page. And then um, this is from one of the girls I worked with. I was teaching poetry with all these kids. Um, so I, I'm writing it from some of her ideas in, in, I, from, in discussion. So counting the scars. The whisperings of stars hiss and murmur the histories of scars. Erase my identity and rewrite, rewrite parallel lines to balance each side of the equation. This equals that, but no other can shelter the small, sad door in the boarding house of compromise. Riding a blinded horse into a landscape of shadows slits in the skin of night. What's stolen will never be found. What's left is an empty echo, an entanglement scratched in sound. The river is lost from her bed and looking for love on the land. The birds caught in her hair are all dead. This is not a song that can be made of rain. I lie myself, I lay myself down in the small cracks where time gathers. I have watched the night come and go again. Sad one. I did a, a little, uh, a, I, I did a, a suite of salmon poems that was part of the salmon in the city. Um, Seattle Arts Commission project where a number of artists were asked to respond to um, our endangered Chinook salmon with making art with salmon. So I, um, I did a suite of five poems. Um, and I'm going to read two of the five. And the first one is smolt. You know, the smolts are the babies. And they're born way, way, way upriver. And this is how they go downstream to the ocean. They go backwards. They back into their future. Um, and they don't turn around until they get a little whiff of salt water. Isn't that wonderful? So, smolt. Being young, I don't know where I go. I face my lake and float backward into my future, trembling on the lip of life, green shadowed. I go with water's flow and trust, strange rapture singing in my blood, ride the river like a knife's edge, breathe and float, oxygen and insect, cut and rise. I've seen where I've been, rehearse my return. Tracing it in latticed strands recorded in starry lace fabric of night. 
Current pulls me down, spills me over smolt slide, plunge the plashy fall, slip the snap of a gray bird's beak, turn to face ocean, opening flat and wide beyond imagining horizon, taste first fingers of bitter brine, flick silver and learn salt. Because my throat itches, I swallow what awaits me. Being young, I've cut my heart on the dream of the high seas. And then the other, another salmon poem. Um, in part of my research to do this, I learned that um, biologists are investigating the possibility that salmon actually use the stars celestial navigation, because it's still a mystery how they find their exact same stream out of the thousands when they go all the way across the ocean, they come all the way back, and how do they find their exact same stream? So no one's saying that this is true, but they're, uh, it's being um, seriously investigated. So celestial navigation. I remember, I remember the hollowed nest and stream of stars the size of my eyes. I remember the swell of water, shape of light, celestial order to mirror the song of river, the constellations glitter into place to make the map. Scorpio, Virgo, Libra, Canis Major, Sirius, the brightest, Orion, my own cold, clean water over stones, the whir of the earth spinning through starry sky, drag of tide waters lifting the estuary, sweet taste of reeds and rushes, edged sedge grass in dance with wind and water flow in silver pool, pulsing scent deep home loam, the river where I was born. Uh, I'm going to do one more salmon one. This, this is uh, the last of the series. So this is af after, um, you know, we, we love the story of salmon because it's all sex and death, right? Um, so this is, this is the last one. Uh, ghost salmon. Everything draws down toward autumn and the way light is broken in splintered color. We are broken to feed the multitudes. Take Eat, this is my body, this is my blood. Eagle and osprey, raven and bear, stonefly and gull tear my flesh. My silt settles and salts the stream. Cedar and fern, algae and fungi, amoeba and protozoa suck a rich soup. My body, emptied of eggs, milky milt settles, completing the circle, eelgrass and catkin, cougar and lynx, creating life from the dead, food for stream, I feed all comers. Okay. Um, uh, I have a manuscript called Wisdom of the Body that will be published later this year. So this is the title poem from that. And I, I did a number of body parts poems, so this is the gut. <clears throat> because the gut is central, it fills and empties, fills and empties. The core of us receives all we take in of the world, absorbs the gold, discards the dross. We mean will when we say someone has guts, closely related to courage, core, and the heart cannot be other than true. Once we get there, though so much is in its tangled way, the mouth knows the taste of its own tongue, hungers for savor, makes meaning of sound, trying to name truth, or not. The gut knows the difference between shit and substance keeps us honest. <laughs> uh, 
And I am going to end with um, the flowers. The flowers. When you ask them what they do for a living, they do not mention photosynthesis. <laughs> but unfurl their slender petals, spread them like a slow dance move, throb a sweet surge of deep scent, unsound the shadow of a sob. Thank you. That again was Judith Roach, and Judith has given so much to the community through her teaching and through her work. And while she's going to be missed at One Reel, we really wish her well with her writing. Next is J.T. Stewart. I want to tell you how pleased I am to be here. I'm happy to be able to read with my friends, and that includes you. I want to set some ground rules for my part of the reading. First of all, no clapping in between pieces. If you're really stone cold out of your mind joyful <laughs> about what I'm doing, there's two things you can do, aside from clapping. There's the ASL. American Sign Language, like that. I love that one. And then I also like raucous people in the, in the house. And so you can yell out, hey, JT, that's pretty good, you know? <laughs> <laughs> or, then forget that other thought. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm going to begin with three poems about poetry. This is, you know, National Poetry Month. And I thought that might be a good way to start. And, I want you to know that at the very end, when I get to my last poem, I'm going to do one about poetry, but I'm going to ask you to join in. And I have some directions for you. So just so you're not you know, carried away with suspense, I'll give you um, one of the words that you're going to have to say. The word is amen. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? No, I'm not. <laughs> Can I have an amen, please? Amen. Ooh, one more time. Can I have an amen? All right, practice that in your head. <laughs> okay, fingers. I want to see fingers, fingers flying across piano keys, fingers strolling over black notes and blue notes and sharp notes and flat notes and get up in the morning notes. Fingers, I want to see B.B. King fingers hitting Lucille's guitar strings. Mmm, ain't that some stuff? Nina Simone, Queen of Soul fingers, backing up the King of Love, Martin Luther King fingers, and hands pounding on America's pulpit, yesterday and now I have a dream fingers. Fingers, my great grandfather's C.C. Ryder fingers, taking the Bible to black folks, using their fingers to read. My grandfather's chef fingers, shaping fancy poet pastry and roasting duck and making people lick their fingers. Mmm, ain't that some stuff? Fingers. My mother's fingers, my father's fingers. All these fingers pushing me into circles of light. My fingers, this poem. <laughs> what do you want, up a little bit more? Is that better? Okay. If you missed the first poem, catch me later. <laughs> this one is called The Trouble with Being a Poet. The trouble with being a poet is the way the mind works. Other folks leap to conclusions, while poets jump into metaphor. Take this card I just got from you in today's mail. It's so formal so aloof. Deep down, I know I got hysterical, pulled my crazy woman act, 
about belonging to another, but mm, mm, your beard is so soft. You smell so sweet. And how, where did you learn to do all those amazing things to my body? And please do, don't, do, don't stop because, because, because poets like to talk about enduring long silences and the doors of the heart clanging shut. Whereas a normal woman would say, fool, you have a problem. <laughs> this one is called New Colossus, and I'll give you a few things to think about here. Uh, if you've been to New York, you know the Statue of Liberty is out there. It was called at one time New Colossus. It came to us as a gift from France in the 19th century. And on the base of the statue, there's a poem by Emma Lazarus. I quote part of that poem in this poem. I begin with an epigraph from a friend of mine whose name is Ed Edmo, and he's an enrolled Shoshone Bannock. New Colossus. Here's what Ed said. I came to the city and slept in phone booths when it rained. Respect this phone booth here on Broadway. Forget AT&T, MCI, Sprint, all their glossy seductions. Regard this phone booth opening its glass bifold door to the tired, the poor, the huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of our teeming streets. Tonight, a man who still speaks the shoot seed, braids and all, beds down here. What he dreams of, no one knows. Tonight, as the millennium comes, he will carve a glass poem that only ravens understand. Watch it. <laughs> okay. um, there's a great R&B artist, her name is Roberta Flack, and she has a song called These Are Trying Times. And this poem that I'm about to read, which is called Aurora's Web, is about the trying times in which we live. There are so many things that we have euphemisms for, all those secret prisons, all those transporting of people, all the torturing that's going on, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is a poem about that very shady world. It's set, however, in the context of a musical, also a film, which some of you may have seen, The Kiss of the Spider Woman. We're looking at three characters. There is, let's see, there's, let me try to find them here, okay. There's uh, Molino, who is going to be tortured to death. There's Valentine, and then there's Aurora, who is the spider woman. So we begin Aurora's web. The patrons are restless. I'm watching Kiss of the Spider Woman in row Q, a great seat on the right aisle near the back of this freezing theater. The radio promises snow, who here has underwear that is pretty but itches? All the ushers wear hats, coats, wool socks, long johns, perhaps made of spun silk or cotton or lurex. Will it snow tonight? Tell me if the snow comes, and if it comes, how soon, how soon? I listen to Molino's songs to Aurora, Death's Spider Woman, come to claim him from a torturous cigar, or is it a cattle prod? And anyhow, why should we care when all this is taking place in some fictional town, in Latino America, in the tense time of the recent past? Who do they think they're fooling with all those canned screams of doomed and damned men who are dreaming of snow they have never seen and will never live to see? Perhaps these prisoners are in Haiti where monocle Teddy rode his great horse up a hill and shot, yes indeed, shot the last of the bears that gave him his name, his due, so to speak. Let us toast the raw courage of men. What's more, someone needs to fix the thermostat. 
Why should I see my breath when I paid so much for this seat? Valentin raises his arms, begs Molina to go on inventing his cinemas of dogma and death. So many screams come now from them both. Perhaps they face torture in Santa Domingo or Havana or Antigua or Grenada. Were at this moment men or are they uniform guards, their arms blazing with power, torment the bare feet of someone named Ramon, Pablo, Ricardo, Hernando, Eduardo, Valentin. They are all the same. What difference does it make? They are all somewhere else, far, far away from this place where the temperature drops and my hair starts to freeze. Why all this third world political nonsense? Why do they have so much misery? In this theatrical I have come to enjoy, Believe me when I tell you this seat cost at least an arm and a leg. Ah, 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 Aurora, Aurora, over here, over here. You gorgeous being dressed in ambient light. Pesime, pesime, mucho. Thank God I remember my Spanish. Kiss me, kiss me, touch me, embrace me, my Aurora. Forget Molino, forget Valentin, forget those so-called political prisoners, those actors. Bless me, you gorgeous heroine. I alone here am real. Death alone is real. Bless me, I am the real one. Bestow on me your spider woman songs, your montages of hopes, of dreams, of life without shadows and pain. The house lights go up, the house lights go down. Aurora, my angel of death, do you see that it snows? Yes, it snows, and the theater is filling with ice. This one is called Promised Land, and it begins with an epigraph, a Swahili proverb. The daughter of a lion is still a lion. Promised Land. Well, isn't this the home of hip bop, rebop, no bop, ice drop, pants drop, bikini drop, boogie drop? <laughs> and those past tense TV stars, we mean Ricardo Tubbs, and the slick white dude, his sidekick, Sonny, my main man, Crockett. And didn't he ever shave? And didn't they ever wear socks? Not to mention BVDs. But who cares? As they was hip hop, no bop, acid drop, ice drop, pants drop, bikini drop, boogie drop, cool. In Miami of Iceland, that land of art deco promise. But, 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 but. Haven't we all fantasized about pink flamingos and lilac BMWs in our layaway till Christmas please shelf? <laughs> our pie in the skies place, and don't we all know by heart all the fin-tailed episodes in Miami Viceland? It beats school in history. We answer to, hey there, mama, but we don't want to be no for real mamas, the kind with kids whose teeth are worse than ours. Okay, 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 some of us want to know, does a dream explode? Or does it pack its little bag and whistle Dixie? Or does it put burnt cork on its little face? Do a little breakdown, scratch its little woolly head, peel a yam or two as it heads for the integrated intersection of life's information highway. And while we're at it, some of us need a new perm, a new Botox here and there, etc. And yes, some of us forgot to ask about how to spell diaspora. Dias what? <laughs> forgot to ask about those real roads from the motherland that 300 years later turned into those roads that led underground to subway platforms on the Canarsie Line, the Brighton Beach Line, the Midtown Manhattan IRT Lines, where early in the mornings our mothers waited to be hired as maids, as scrub ladies, as servants, as baby watchers. They waited on the slatted green benches, handbags, paper bags, shopping bags, cotton bags overflowing, with sponges, washcloths, mop, cleaning rags, flat irons, stocking caps, pressed head rags, gray uniforms, bottles of lye, ammonia, octagon, soap, furniture, polished carpets, slippers, fixed smiles. They wanted to be singled out. Yes, Miss Lady, look at my arms, my hands, my nails. Over here, Miss Lady, pass her by. She from the islands, I talk good. Me, I go to church, I sleep in, I watch your children. 
my children, they're big enough to watch themselves, and you pay me my car fare, plus let me take the leavings. Bless you, Miss Lady. Uh huh. And in the promised land they waited, and on the promised land they waited. Our mothers, our used to be mothers, our would be mothers, our could have been mothers, our once upon a time mothers, our once in a time mothers, us. You know what that means. <laughs> okay. um, this poem is called Mr. Apollo Greets the Tourists, a found poem. And so the couple of things I, I want to um, just explain to you. Uh, the Apollo Theater is in Harlem, New York City. It's gotten so upscale that they do tours now there. You know, af after things have been around for a long time, they become cultural markers and they run tours. I'm sure they're doing that here in Seattle somewhere. Places you never would have dreamed they would you know, charge money to go to. Okay. So they're, they're doing tours to uh, churches too. I read an article in the New York Times about the tour that was going on at the Apollo Theater and I was fascinated by it and so I decided to work it into a found poem which means that most of the language here is not mine. The way I manipulated the language though makes it a found poem. And I begin with the um, epigraph from the text itself. As the theater's historical tour director, he isn't merely identifying the greats. He's got something to say. He seems congenitally happy. And the he refers to Billy Mitchell, and you'll meet him in a moment. Mr. Apollo greets the tourists. I got sunshine on a cloudy day. Billy Mitchell, he tells the tourists they are family. He's not called Mr. Apollo for nothing, says the New York Times. Look at these sepia-toned lobby cards, he says. Billy Mitchell, he tells the tourists they are family. Listen, he says, shoulders swaying, the four tops, the temptations. Look at all these sepia high-toned cards, he says. All right, give it up for Ella Fitzgerald. He paces as if on the, on the Apollo's stage. Listen, he says, shoulders swaying, the four tops, the temptations, Ella. What you're seeing, folks, is the great Apollo's past. Give it up for Ella Fitzgerald. He paces as if on the Apollo stage. Yeah, let's speak of Ella. She started out here on amateur night. What you're seeing, folks, is the great Apollo's past. He likes to test the tour group, mostly elderly women from Long Island. Yeah, let's speak of Ella. She started out on amateur night here on 125th Street, so let's see. You all know this one. I got sunshine on a cloudy day. He likes to test the tour group, mostly elderly women from Long Island. The tourists, the women mostly, they clap, they pat their feet, they sing. So, let's see. You all know this one. I got sunshine on a cloudy day. Gorgeous darlings, Billy Mitchell tells the group touring the Apollo, you are family. The tourists, the women mostly, they clap, they pat their feet, they sing. You are doing just fine. This must be your first time up here in Harlem. Gorgeous darling, historian Billy Mitchell tells the group touring the Apollo. He's not called Mr. Apollo for nothing, says the New York Times. See how happy he is? See how happy we all are? We are family. This must be your first time up here in Harlem, Billy Mitchell says. So let's see, who knows who sang I Got Sunshine on a Cloudy Day? No, it's not Ella. <laughs> no, it's not the Four Tops. But that's okay, we are family. Okay, let's hear it for the temps. The Mighty Temptations, everybody sing. Everybody sing. I got sunshine, even on a cloudy day. Yes, even on a cloudy day. This is called Late Night Email from New Orleans, pre-Katrina. And I want to dedicate this poem to all the people from New Orleans past, present, and future, 
and all the spirits from New Orleans, past, present, and future. That may include some of you, I'm not sure. Hey there, trust you forgive my leaving Seattle. No fond farewell to turn up here, one suitcase only, an enormous hunger and two lush weeks to fill. The French Quarter embraces me in tourist ease, beau carré, and I retaliate. Mardi Gras is done, thank God. That madness spent leaves Bourbon Street to Satchmo's ghost. In silver tux, ashen and radiant, he can boogaloo the night away, outstripping all the stripper joints. Dinner at Antoine's last night consumed my weight and yours in French cuisine, in part. Les escargots à la bordelaise, chou fleur au gratin, salade mirabeau, orange brûlot, café au lait, and two Alka-Seltzer gold <laughs> before the coup de grace and ancient brandy. This place built in 1840, no one forgets. Doormen, wine stewards, busboys, a trunk full of other flunkies. My waiter, a sad-eyed worm, in baggy funereal suit, could not palm the tip. Had beet stains on his gloves. Snatched his loot when no one looked, or so he hoped, class tells. Afterwards, two towering mint juleps at the court of two sisters. You get to keep the glass, remember? Jealous? Good. The quarter isn't yours, you know, even though you lived here, worked here, played here, before your Seattle emigration. Followed myself across the street, nicely spirited, to Pat O'Brien's, then to an outdoor spot, <laughs> let's not drop names, for brew in frosted steins and jazz. Touchstone, abracadabra word, elixir of all the alchemists, your second love and mine spawned in this voodoo place. Tenor saxes tease the awesome Mississippi, father of the waters. A bass riff electrifies Lake Borgna and its mother gulf of Mexico. A platinum coronet woos Miss Beauty herself, Lake Pontchartrain. Conjure music, arousing ancestors, demanding blood, and the waters surrender their treasures. Up, up from the delta bottom they come, riding the sweet savannah of April, sashaying up the streets of the quarter, Decatur, Chart, Royale, the nameless, the formless, the good, the bad. Napoleon, Jean Lafitte, Du Plagueur, Andrew Jackson, Marie Laveau, Creoles, slaves, freedmen, planters, dandies, bells, New Orleans folk, unmindful of time. And up front, Louis Satchmo Armstrong leading them, leading them all right past my table, headed for Rampart Street. Drop into the 13 coins on your way home from work. Blackjack Daniels would do it just fine. Celebrate your friend here who waits for the saints to come marching back. Have mercy, JT. Okay, here we go. So, it's a little rehearsal, it's not too strenuous. This is my last poem, and it involves you. Okay, you need to say the phrase, let there be. And, and these are even beats, so it's like, let there be. Try it, please. Let there be. Ooh, pretty good. One more time. Let there be. Okay. Now let's see if you can remember the other one, which was, amen, amen. amen. Okay, here's the way it's going to go. I'm going to read the title. And when I hold up this hand, you're going to say, let there be. Then I'm going to say something. And I'll be holding my hand up three times so you know what to expect. No nervousness out there. <laughs> and then at the very end, it's going to be amen, amen. And so you don't miss it, I'll put up both hands. 
Okay. So remember now, I start off, and then you're going to say, let there. Here we go. Let there be. Let there be. Poems of praise, poems of celebration, poems of occasion. Let there be. Poems of place, poems of ceremony, poems of adulation. Poems of exorcism, poems of exhortation, poems of ancestors. Let there be poems, let there be poems. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, JT. I think it was 10 years ago that JT last read, and we were at the old Central Library on this same spot. It's fun to hear from you today. Uh, so, <laughs> next up is Pesha Joyce Gertler, who has served as the Seattle Poet Populist for 2005-2006. We're going to hear from Pesha first, and for her last poem, she will be joined by Simone Ladrama on hand drums and Esther Sugai on flute. Pesha. I'm so happy to be here. I'm gonna try this mic. I had asked for the other one, but I think I'll experiment with this one. Can you hear me? Is it working? Let me know if it isn't, because I have another one here, so. Okay. Um, I, there are so many people to thank. I want to thank Nick, who's been the main proponent of the poet populist movement. I don't think he's here anymore. I think he's left. Um, I also want to thank Bob Redmond, who isn't here, from One Reel, and Frank Video, who works with the city council, and Judith Roach, who does millions of things everywhere, but has also been a, uh, the literary director of Bumbershoot for many years. And I particularly want to thank Frank and Judith for being so supportive through this year. There, there are so many ins and outs in doing this wonderful, wonderful position. And they've, I've always felt that they cared very much about this and were there not only for me, but for the poet populist movement itself. My love, uh, I, I just wanted to also say that this has been the most fulfilling year of my professional life. I am so grateful for having this opportunity. My love for taking poetry into the community, into places where it is not normally heard, has been accelerated and multiplied as a poet populist. My first assignment, well, I'm not gonna go into everything, but my first assignment was Catherine's Place, a women's transitional center. And later, I went to a Women in Science conference, another one for Women in Aging. And all of these, I either did readings or gave workshops or did both. Then, also in an assisted living center, where a woman came in who was 100 and said, do you think it's time I started my memoir? And I thought, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I knew I was slow, but that was amazing. And of course, as Nick mentioned, the reception for the swearing-in ceremony for the mayor and the city council members. And next week, I'm going to be going to my granddaughter's grade school. She's here today, Felicia. And hopefully work with the students in terms of writing. I'm also going to appear in the ROC newsletter. That's WROC, the Welfare Rights Organizing Coalition. And just saw a new friend, wonderful. Anyway, I plan to uh, also do a workshop there, and I'm gonna be at the University District Fair, and there, there are a lot of um, bookmarks there that have my webpage, and you can find that, and on that you can find my um, email address if you want to keep in touch and find out about other things that are going on. Also, what I'm most excited, two things I'm very excited about that are coming up. One is I want to teach at the David Edgar's Free School. I don't know if you know about that one, but it's starting to spread all over the country. He's arranging these schools, writing schools, for students from first grade through seniors in high school. And I worked for many years as a poet in the schools. So I'm very, very excited about this. 
I haven't even contacted them yet, but I know it's going to happen. And then another is when I went to that first place, Catherine's place, an artist had made a beautiful sculpture on a wall. And they were, there were masks of many different cultures and races and languages beneath them, all of them saying, welcome. And my assignment is to write, one of my assignments is to write a poem this year. And I was so drawn to that, I felt, I think there's a poem there and planned to get together with the artist so she would translate all of this for me. Well, she wrote the other day and said not only that, but she wanted to um, start a new project in which she wanted to create some art and include poetry. And she wanted to know if I wanted to be involved in that. And of course, I'm ecstatic about that. So lots of wonderful things continue to be happening. And I hope that all of you will do everything you can to keep this program going. I, I will certainly do everything I can. OK, I, I, I guess it's only reasonable that I begin with this poem, which most of you have probably heard many times, because I've dedicated it to the poet populist movement. But I couldn't imagine giving this reading and not sharing this one. It's called The Poet's Hierarchy. It seems that even here there's a hierarchy, a poet's heaven, where the favored few get to live, feeding on fame, Pulitzers, and paychecks, parties and applause and book signings in the midst of endless wine and crackers and cheese. Oh, the celebrity. Oh, the throngs. And then there are the rest of us, also in love with the word, the mystery. We dance unnoticed in the alleys of the world. We dance barefoot on the pavement in mud. We are the peasants, the gypsies, the beggars, dancing outside the poet's heaven, dancing nonetheless under stars. <laughs> Someone first, when I read that at uh, a dinner for Sam Hamill, to which I was invited and asked to read, and I um, can't remember what I was going to add about that. Anyway, I'll, I'll just skip that for now. But um, oh, I know one of, one of the people in the audience came up to me later and gave me a book that she had published, just published a book of poetry, and inside the dedication she wrote for someone who dances under stars or in, in the mud, but dances in the mud but under stars. I thought that was wonderful. The next one, I love reading this one this time of year. It's Fishing for Cherry Blossoms. And because we have, I mean, they're almost gone now, aren't they? But I was, I need to explain the background to you. This is not going to make any sense. I was walking down the street, down 15th, on my way home. And about two or three blocks away, I saw a little girl. And she was hurling this, this fishing rod, or the, the line for the fishing rod up in the air. And it looked like she was actually trying to catch the cherry blossoms from that distance, and that line went through my head, fishing for cherry blossoms, and I went, ah, that's a poem. So I stopped right there and dug out a piece of paper and my pen and leaned on a parked car and wrote this poem that I'm going to share with you. Now, of course, when I caught up to her, I realized she was just practicing, and although she was near the cherry blossom tree, she wasn't doing anything with it, but it, it looked like that from the, and I said something to her, and she looked at me like I was really strange, and she thought, my mother warned me about people like you went in the house, so. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't get to share the poem with her, but anyway, fishing for cherry blossoms. She is fishing for cherry blossoms in the early May evening. She tosses her rod in the perfumed air, skims the blossom sea. I send her a first star wish. May they bite by the droves at the end of her line. And later, when the flower moon rises, may each pink petal Tastes succulent in all her dreams. And this, oh, thank you. This next one was um, on, the, on the city buses for a long time, and I haven't really looked at it, just ran across it last night and decided to share it because it seems like a Seattle poem. Late into the night, the city is typing poems of houses dreaming old secrets while tree branches brush the moon. Tavern music is dying in the clang of a garbage lid, blown down the street with paper and leaves. Homeless women and men sprawl on cardboard beds while the last buses chug to the barn. Somewhere a siren, a snore, the sounds of love, until the stillness swallows all sound. It is the hour of the wolf. The poets leave their computers and step outside. Watch their poems rise, 
rise and disappear into the spaces between stars. You're being very generous with all of this applause. Um, I want to share the healing time with you next. Um, it's been the most published and republished poem that I've ever written. It's a very short poem, but it seems to um, have its own journey in the world. I wanted to share with you that it's going to be presented at, in Mini Hall at the UW on May 30th at 7.30, I believe. The uh, Jeffrey Bors, who is the director of choral music, is going to present a musical version of this poem. A, a musician in New York actually composed the music, and somehow they found each other. And so that's going to happen at that time. I'm very excited about that, too. I hope you can come. The Healing Time. Finally, on my way to yes, I bump into all the places where I said no to my life, all the untended wounds, the red and purple scars, those hieroglyphs of pain carved into my skin, my bones, those coded messages that send me down the wrong street again and again, where I find them, the old wounds, the old misdirections, and I lift them one by one close to my heart, and I say, holy, holy. Um, thank you. <laughs> very, very generous audience. The, the next poem is one of a few that I'm going to share with you that um, I, I decided to, when I was trying to make a decision about which poems to read tonight or today, I felt that a good approach for me at least might be to ask myself some questions about, well, what makes a poet? What made me turn to poetry? What made me become a poet? And then what made me become a populist? I didn't realize I was a populist. <laughs> until I became a poet populist, I had the, the, the title. I thought, oh, that's what I've been doing all these years, okay. <laughs> so this one is, is in credit to my father. The title of the poem is Aleph Bet, which are the first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And when he would tell me stories, it's great. I grew up in a family, extended family of storytellers and poets, so I was very lucky in that sense as an only child. But. Um, I was unlucky, too, because part of this was because my mother died when I was a baby, so that part was not, of course, welcome. At any rate, before the story began, this little girl, who was me, had to say the magic words to get the door to open, and the magic words were Aleph Bet, which I thought was very clever because he was teaching me the Hebrew alphabet. For years, I thought it was the equivalent of abracadabra. I, I don't know how many years it was before I finally realized it was actually the alphabet. Anyway, the Kabbalah's in here too, and I think now it's become so popularized, everyone knows what that is. And the Shekhinah, which is the feminine divine presence in the Hebrew tradition, or the Jewish tradition. Aleph Bet. She sits on her father's lap. It is the hour of story. He conjures the girl and boy who fly over trees dripping with candy jewels. As dependable as wings on fairies, they arrive at the magic door a polished glass entranceway to the land where everything is possible. But alas and alack, the once upon a time beginning is stuck. The door will not open. Papa waits for the appearance of his small daughter. And lo and behold, here she is on his lap. He asks if she knows the words, the words of power to bid the door to open. And yes, oh yes, she knows. Wavering on a knee, hands pressing the air, she whispers the words, Aleph Bet. Aleph Bet, as in the ancient Hebrew script. Aleph Bet, as in the sacred caves of mystics. Aleph Bet, as in the Kabbalah smoke. Aleph Bet, as in the first once upon a time when the Holy One spoke and the words became mountains and stars and sea. Aleph Bet, she says, like a Holy One, a Shekhinah, a goddess girl. Aleph Bet, she says, and the door opens wide. <laughs> Thank you. I love reading this um, to my stu to students, very special students, when I have a really wonderful class, and some of them are like that. They're just magical from the beginning. I love reading that because of 
the statement that that language opens doors, which of course it does. And this next one is about my mother and um, the influence that I feel with her is, well, because she died so young, or while I, and while I was so young too, I have no memory of her, so my grief is not the grief of loss, but it's the grief of absence. And of course, absence is also conveys the power of the unknown. I knew, I knew that. I knew there was mystery and power there. And the place that the poem enters is, of course, the unknown and the mystery. So I think in trying to sort of piece together why I ended up in the middle of poetry, uh, these were a couple of the answers that I received. Read um, Esther now. That was her name. This is for Susan Miles' painting. Oh, I have to tell you something about that. Susan knew a friend who ended up in jail. I don't know why. I don't remember what the story was. But he asked her to please keep the skeleton that he had. It wasn't a real skeleton. It was just a duplicate. While he was in jail, because he didn't want to lose it. He was going to have to give everything else away. And she said, sure. She, was, she put it in the window, and she, right in front of her window, and she said, we didn't have to worry about anyone breaking in during that time. <laughs> but she would dress it. She's an artist, and she would dress it in various costumes and then paint them. And she was at an art show that I was participating in, not as an artist, but as a poet. And I was so drawn to this particular painting, and I didn't know why until later, when I realized that the clothing that she had put on this, this skeleton were ex identical with the ones that my mother had worn in one of the snapshots I had of her. So she named the, poem, uh, the painting Esther after I shared this poem with her. Okay, Esther, for Susan Lytle's painting of the same name. It's you, mother, isn't it, to whom I'm drawn, you in the elegant white blouse, the black skirt, black wide-brimmed hat, and it's your conversion day, isn't it, your classes with the rabbi completed, the rabbi also divorced, and also a lover of music like you. Did you sing your way through the stories of David and Solomon? Naomi and Ruth, and who chose your new name, Esther? The season was spring, April in fact, that intoxicating month, and Esther Ishtar was a goddess of spring. So Esther it was, and you and my father married again, this time in the temple before the hidden ark. Then you stepped out into the April sun and posed for the camera, a certain panache in your air, as if you walked a tightrope with no net and no fear, and you did. For you dared to dream and to balance your feet and your future on hope. Soon your August child would be born, you'd move to New York. Manny would once more take up law and stop this penny life of door-to-door -door selling. And why shouldn't you find your equilibrium on a thick skein of hope? You were young and alive. So you threw back your head and smiled, and the camera clicked. You didn't see, how could you, as I see now, a skeleton in filmy white blouse, black hat and skirt, striking a jaunty pose and smiling, white bones polished in the sun. And I was raised, after my mother's death, I was raised in extended family, but the central figure was my grandmother. And if they taught me, the, the uncles and my father and the other relatives taught me the power of language to open doors, she taught me the power of language to close doors. When she arrived in this country as an immigrant, she was, uh, and she had to work to support the family. She was the only one who could do that, and at that time in the sweatshops. So that meant that she was unable to go to night school. I mean, she did try, but she would fall asleep. She was so tired. And um, so she never learned to either speak or read in English. She could speak a sort of broken English, but she couldn't read. And so I saw the way language locked her out. And that maybe was part of the beginning, at least for me, of being concerned with finding the voices that aren't heard, finding those who are marginalized, giving a voice, making sure that, and going to as many places as possible. Because she certainly couldn't even make it to night school. Someone had to reach her. I don't know how come I didn't end up in ESL instead of creative writing but in terms of teaching. But anyway, OK, here we go. Homage. This is for my grandmother. Through the broken words of the language you never learned, sleeping during English classes after 10 hours in the sweatshop, 
through the broken dreams of worlds closed to you, of careers outside the kitchen that your sisters would find, through free mornings stolen by the factory where you sat long hours pushing stitches into seams, through paychecks that turned into food and rent until it was time for you to move out of the sweatshop into your own kitchen, through husband and sons and girl-grandchild, through the stockpiling of dreams that decayed and died, these words of mine emerge, these words like roses climbing tenement walls, these words like songs in a broken land. <laughs> I owe her a lot. And this next one also, being Jewish, is very much a part of who I am as a writer and part of what fed into not only being a poet, but of course being a populist. So there were many different levels on which I began to understand what it meant to be marginalized. This one is called, and she sang of Rachmanis. Rachmanis is a Hebrew word that means compassion. Excuse me. a very tender kind of compassion, such as a mother might feel for a newborn child. And then there's the colloquial word, greenhorn. I don't know if anyone knows what that is, but that was what the immigrants used to call each other. It was the ultimate put down where you're nothing but a greenhorn. Yeah. And she sang of Rachmanis. I, I'm almost a little bit embarrassed to read this one because this is coming from the young part of me that didn't want to be Jewish, that wanted to be American. I didn't know you could be both. I wanted to be like everybody else, you know. And I didn't realize that you could be both, and I also didn't realize the value and the richness of what I was trying so hard to reject. But anyway, here it is. And she sang of Rachmanis, dragging me with you through childhood, shopping at the push carts, the leather-faced crone plucking feathers, the smelly man sing-songing, rags for sale, pickles in barrels, and everyone who read reading the Jewish daily foreword. How I hated them, and you, Mama, for your refusal to put on the American style, white bread instead of matzo or rye, supermarkets with pickles sealed in jars, the New York Times and precise English, just like the mothers in our school books. How I hated you. The Yiddish stigma burning my skin when you spoke, orthodox greenhorn hanging on to the shtetl, the old country ways. Couldn't you see we're American now? Today, in a life smooth as linoleum and Campbell's tomato soup, predictable as whitewashed faces, I search for your cobblestone voice. On Friday nights, light the Shabbos candles, read an English translation of the foreword in broken Yiddish, Rachmanis, Rachmanis. Thank you. And then another part is, of course, just growing up in New York, which is every, every poet should grow, every kid should grow up in New York, I think. But I don't know about staying there, but at least growing up there. This next one um, expresses some of the, the tremendous exuberance that I think characterizes New York and, and is particularly the multicultural aspect. There are so many um, different races and, and, and cultures and languages and music. You, you and the windows open up in the summertime, you hear all these different multi-languages coming, the songs coming forth in different languages. Just wonderful, I love it. Anyway, this, this captures some of that and the exuberance of youth as well. I was a teenager at the time. The 29th Street Trolley. Remember pennies planted on its rail and cold whipped corners of night, excuse me, sparkled by trolleyed arcs, the gypsy caravan, the lighted ship clanging through the dark, colors exploding above its roof in a July 4th sky any season we chose and clambering aboard, pushing beyond the turnstile, jolted past bike riding in the boundaries of our mother's kosher kitchens, into a merging of sweat in serapis, saris, yarmulkes, velvet and rags, per excuse me, perfume mingled with locks. We lurched toward our rounded seat in the rear, pressed our faces into the glass, the buildings bumping past, old women leaning out of windows as they always lean from New York windows, this time staring at us, at us, 
a spangle of light zooming onward to 29th Street were electrified, we whooped to see there on the corner Reticliano, Shannon, and Schultz, the boys of our rock candy dreams, waiting in the night. A run, a jump, and they were on, plunging to the back seat we always saved while Terlizzi ran behind. Terlizzi on the edge, leaped for the running board, swayed and held on, the trolley's anti-hero, scoring a free ride, brown-skinned, Sicilian blonde, laughing, waving outside the windows that locked us in while we outsqueeled clicketing wheels, outsung electric motors hum on the ride that would last forever, we thought, the ride that would take us everywhere while we bounced in and out of our April punctured transfer. Gee, which is great, I'm glad this is being recorded when I'm feeling really down, I'll have to listen to this. I often wonder why I didn't become a plumber instead, but I mean, at least you make money if you're a plumber, but okay. This next one is in this edition of Seattle Woman, which is free, and I think I have a couple of extra copies over there unless they're gone, but they're all over in, in bookstores and um, I don't know of any place else. Oh, campuses, yeah. And my poem isn't there. It's in this, in this edition, the May edition. And it's titled, If You Would Walk, oh, you're still hearing me, is this coming through okay? Okay. If You Would Walk Your Own Heart's Path, and it's, got an epigraph, it begins with an epigraph, the false self stole in to take the girl's place. That's from, by Emily Hancock from The Girl Within. There is a door you must find and open and walk through into the neighbor's yard where once you balanced as if on air, one foot in front of the other, a scrawny edging and swaying yet steady steady on the cedar ledge of the fence that divided your childhood with warnings for girls who dared. You must re-enter that brazen moment knowing there is no tightrope you would not try, feeling the juices rising as if you were a tendril pushing up, up through the summer night in between the glitter of stars. Let's see, I'm going to skip some of these. Okay, I'm going to go on and read this one. She insisted, this is, this is by Goldie. Beauty contest interview with Goldie. I've read this before a couple of times. but um, This is a persona poem. For those of you who aren't familiar with that particular form, it's when I take on the voice of someone else. So imagine a woman who's a little past her prime. She's sort of bulgy, but she's still, she's got a lot of bulges, but she's still wearing a real tight red satin dress. And um, she's being interviewed about what, and she's in Coney Island. In Coney Island, they have all of these, these um, outer stands that you can stand on and dance and whatever and entice them to come inside and, of course, pay money to see the whole show. So that's what she's doing. So now imagine you can see her. And as I said, I say she had blonde hair, poofy, sticking out all over the place. Okay. So this beauty contest interview with Goldie, chorus girl at Coney Island. Okay. The thing I don't like, if you want to ask me, the thing that I don't like about them beauty contests is the way those old geezers sit there, staring at tits and ass, hips and thighs, face and teeth and hair, as if that's all there is to a broad. And here are all these poor young girls from Nebraska and Iowa and maybe even Brooklyn. And what do they know from nothing? And first thing you know, they're counting calories and measuring their waistlines and exercising their pecs for bigger boobs because the guys, you know how they are. Baby boys still want mommy. Only American men have this boob fetish, you know. So, like I was saying, who asks what books have you read? Or what's your opinion of world politics? Or do you have any ideas about how to control or punish rapists? Or what kind of care for the oldsters, to say nothing of the youngsters? And hey, what do you think, Blondie? Yeah, you, about sending our boys off to shoot each other. Now, can you think of any other use those boys might have put their lives to besides being stretched out on those fields dead? Now, do you think that's a waste or what? 
And this is what our leaders do, our men, throughout all time. Sure, I went to school once. I cracked the history books. I know about the wars, the generals, and the dukes, and the kings, and the fiefs. Sure, honey, I know them all. The same story again and again. And what's that you say? Hey, what does that have to do with beauty contests? Well, let me tell you, Sam, you ask those broads what they think. You start giving awards for the beauty of a peace plan for minds, for heart, for soul. You stop paying so much attention to what's on the outside because you're scared of seeing what's on the inside. And that's what I think of beauty contests. Baby, we ain't had one yet. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I celebrate the applause with you on that one. Okay. Let's see, I think I think we're starting to wrap up. I'll read um, maybe a couple of short ones, and then we'll go. Then one that will lead into the the one with music. Uh, Chimera. This is a cynical one. Imagine that. <laughs> I wrote this shortly before my divorce, many many years ago. Chimera, grieve not, good parents, about the ogres we digested, while you silver spooned hands Christian into our childhood. They did not harm us half so much as the happily ever afters. But I believe in happily ever afters again, so I don't know. Okay, and this next one is thinking, this one's also probably the most cynical poem I've ever written. But thinking thoughts while walking on Avenue A, Brooklyn, New York. At 12, we figured out what the adults didn't know, how poverty and hunger could end how bombing and killing were options, not absolutes, or maybe not options at all. How God could sometimes, or often, be a woman. How skin color and genitals were hardly grounds for war. How hatred was a curable disease. Someday, we thought, when we are the grown-ups, when we, the wise ones who have figured it out, are in charge, these problems will disappear like acne and braces and that scary space near the cellar door. That is scary. Isn't there a time when we think that really, you know, we've got it figured out and the world's going to be so much better when we finally are in charge? And then, okay, well, so much for that. <laughs> this next poem is called, it's, it's still in process, but I want to share it with you anyway. It's called Ways of Becoming. And it's for Basho, who, ta who taught his students to become what they wanted to write about. Oh, by the way, I want to back up a little bit, a minute. The one about Goldie was written at the beginning of the first Gulf War. I haven't written one for the second Gulf War, but unfortunately, it, I, it, will, it will come in time. But anyway, um, this one, Basho was a, uh, taught haiku. And he was a Japanese poet. Some of you may be very familiar with him. At any rate, when he wanted his students to write about bamboo, he wouldn't say, go to the library and study and read everything you can about bamboo and then write about it. He'd say, no, go outside and become a bamboo tree, then write about it, or a caterpillar, or whatever they were working on. So I like that. And, and this poem comes from that space, imagining that some students might want to write about Jerusalem, for instance. OK, ways of becoming. Become a scrap of paper on which a prayer is scrawled. Become the prayer crammed into a cranny in the wall, the wailing wall in Jerusalem. Become the wailing. Wail for the human children whose blood seeps into the wall. Become Jerusalem, holy city of bombs, broken pavement, broken people. Become the wall, a memory of the temple Solomon built the temple that held Asherah. Become Solomon, building the temple. Become Asherah, Hebrew goddess of the hillside. Become the temple. In the world of the imagination, where bombs cannot reach, yes, become the temple. And now I want to close with reading Sarah and Hagar and the musicians Simone La Drama and Esther Sagai will join me. This is a poem that I wrote um, several years ago and I've added bits and pieces to it here and there. Traveled to Israel and presented it. And um, 
it was enthusiastically received. It, it's really a sort of a woman-centered poem. It's about Sarah and Hagar. But men seem to like it, including Palestinian men. Well, I remember one Palestinian man saying, oh, if only I had known about this poem, I would have had you go to every Palestinian village everywhere, you know. And we were ready to leave the next day, so I don't know how that would have worked out, but I would have loved it. But um, he appreciated so much that Hagar was being honored. And I, you know, Hagar is the mother of the, the Arab people. So um, I, I guess my feeling about this is that the dream of this poem holds forth the dream of peace. And everyone, Palestinians and Israelis, both seem to feel very strongly that that was their dream, too. Of course, they're in the middle of it. Who am I? It's sitting over here in safe America, more or less safe America. Um, but they, they spoke about people I just went out on the streets and met, you know, that weren't programmed. But they would speak about the other side, about the suffering that went on the other side. Israelis would, would talk to me, Israeli Jews would talk to me about the suffering of Palestinians. Palestinians, on the other hand, would talk to me about the suffering of the Israelis. They seemed to get it in some very profound way. I don't know if that's still true. I have, this was many years ago that I went there. I would like to go back. I'm hoping very much I can. But anyway, that's, this poem was, came out of a time of isolation when I was in um, Eastern Washington working as a poet in the schools, and I began to do some research about Sarah and Hagar, and it was so astounded to discover that it all went back to the rule about first son rights. And that eventually, I, in my interpretation, at least in reading it at the time, was that that's what led to so many of the wars and what kept me from moving there. I wanted to move there with my family. But every time I would get ready to, there would be another bombing and a bus or something to that effect. And I thought, wow, that, that law that they created those thousands of years ago is still influencing my life today and the lives of so many others. And I began to think, maybe that could be different. Anyway, I did more research, and this poem came out of that. So it's titled Sarah and Hagar. And um, my musicians, my musicians will join. Sarah and Hagar, dedicated to Yitzhak Rabin and the Israeli and Palestinian peace workers. If you want peace in the middle, oh, this is a, a quote from Golda Meir. If you want peace in the Middle East, give leadership to the Arab and Israeli grandmothers, and then you'll have peace. The poem is written in four parts. We know them only through Abraham, as we have always known and defined women through men. But who were they, these women of the ancient lands, our mothers, our grandmothers, who once walked the same earth we walk today? Who were they before Abraham? It is said that Sarah lived in the land of Ur in Mesopotamia, where women danced with the moon mother, and she danced too, in moon fire, and poured mother of pearl libations under the sacred tree. On each of the four corners, each one holy ground, she lay stretching herself out on the dark body of the mother earth, and in each corner, she tasted the mystery of a holy kiss. And Hagar, what of Hagar from Egypt land? Born with the language of dance, she knew the movement of trees and rivers and birds. When the villagers were lonely or sad or ill, Hagar appeared and danced her holy dance, her meditation, her medicine, her moving prayer. Though they sat very still, it seemed she lifted them, swirling, bending, and leaping onto and around the cantaloupe moon. And when she stopped, all their pores sang.
And where did they meet? In Pharaoh's harem. Hagar as his dancing slave, Sarah as one of his many wives. Through all the veiled, perfumed rooms of Pharaoh's palace, Sarah and Hagar wandered, walking, whispering, laughing. And in the inner courtyard, in the light of the singing moon, they danced to the four corners, to the moon, to the goddess in each other, to Asherah and to Isis. They danced. Plagues, plagues everywhere, and the secret is out. Sarah is Abraham's wife. Has she caused the plagues, Pharaoh asks, and releases her, offering one of his slaves as a gift. Of course, it is Hagar she chooses. Together, on camels, in a caravan, with Abraham, they set out for the promised land. And this is where our story usually begins. Genesis. They arrived in Canaan and settled in a grove of terebinth trees where they dwelt for many years. Because Sarah bore Abraham no children, she gave Hagar to Abraham to be his wife. And Hagar bore a son, Ishmael. Later, Sarah bore a son, Isaac. Because Isaac was the younger, Sarah feared for first son writes and said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman for her son shall not be heir with my son. And God said, in Isaac I will establish my covenant and with his seed after him. In Ishmael I will make a great nation because he is thy seed. And Sarah became the mother of the Hebrew people. And Hagar became the mother of the Arab people. But the drop of strychnine had fallen. The drop of strychnine had fallen into their lives and floated in the jugs of milk and honey as Hagar and her son were driven to the place of skulls out of the land of plenty, the myth of lack, the rule of first son rights, a ladder one climbs up or down, they'll all arrive at the same place of mutual destruction. On the path to the place of skulls, Hagar clutched Ishmael's hand, then turned to Sarah, a wild fear in her eyes. But Sarah withdrew into the tent on a specious errand for Isaac, her sleeping child, and Abraham swallowed his sob. Part three. I like to dream how it might have been. I like to dream how it might have been had Sarah raced to the curtain draped doorway and called out to them and Hagar and Ishmael had turned to the familiar voice and come running and held each other and wept, then sat cross-legged on the wild grasses and holding hands, decided to change the law into a Sarah and Hagar law in which all the land is given to all the sons and all the daughters equally. I 
I like to dream them living out their lives within the heart of their new law, Sarah and Hagar in blue pimento-dyed robes, strolling arm in arm to the well in the ring of stones where they lift their water-skin buckets, scoop the living water, their heads leaning toward each other. Laughing, they trade secrets while they grind corn side by side, shaping then dipping cornflower balls into soured goat's milk. Across the curtain wall tent, their sons giggle with Abraham. Later, while the children sleep in the dark stillness of the Judean night, they gather round the late embers. Abraham cradles his harp, plucks notes that drift to nearby stars, while Sarah and Hagar sing the poems that breathe in their dreams. Or suns and moons, they become crones. As bark and leaves, they lean into the wide-leafed Mediterranean oaks, their old shoulders touching while they weave memories and dreams like goat's hair into cloth. Our grandmothers, they call themselves, watching their sons grow to manhood, a shared land, wives, children, and children's children. Our grandmothers, watching the fertile valley filling up with themselves, with us. Under the tree of oracles, they rest and watch and speak. Listen. <laughs> Their words rustle. In that wildflower gust shaking the leaves. In the deep silence of heartwood. In the dark mystery of roots underground. Press your ear to the bark and listen. Their words humming, their poems singing, speaking. Listen, let us listen while our grandmothers speak. Getting better all the time. <laughs>